Hello everyone! Welcome to my music tutorials for people who want to learn how to compose music, but also people who want to enjoy music and want to understand it better. The Romantic period in music is very roughly between 1800 and 1900, and it stretches all the way from early Romantic composers like Beethoven and Schubert to late Romantic composers like Brahms and Mahler. Today I want to show you how the second movement of a romantic symphony might be composed. Every movement of a symphony plays an important role, of course, but the second movement is especially close to my heart. Or maybe one way to put it is, the second movement is the heart of the symphony, the emotional heart. It's the movement full of emotion and longing and deep contemplation and beauty, and without it, if you removed it from the whole piece, you'd be in danger of a symphony that's entirely superficial, like a movie that's all plot and action and no character depth. And this importance of the second movement is doubly so for a romantic symphony. As usual, I want to start at the beginning, build up a sketch, and show you layer by layer how to make a complete movement. This is something you can do yourself. If I can do it, you can do it. You might do it in a different style, in a different way, but I'll show you at least one way to do it. Every movement has an architectural form, and today I picked a really simple and popular form, the theme and variation movement. You invent a theme, or more likely you steal someone else's theme, and then you write a series of variations on it. In this case, I'll invent my own theme, but just know that stealing was a time-honored tradition in music for centuries before our world got very legalistic. If you follow my videos, you know that I'm in the middle of what I call the Tutorial Symphony No. 2 in four romantic styles. Each movement samples a different perspective on the romantic period. The first movement had a mid to late romantic flavor and borrowed some stylistic elements from Brahms. I then jumped to the third movement in an early romantic style with a Schubertian flavor. Now I want to tackle the second movement. What kind of style should we choose? There's a strain in the late romantic period called chromatic harmony, harmony that floats through distant keys with great ease, that doesn't resolve when you think it should, that leaves you second-guessing where home is, where the harmonic ground floor is. You'll find chromatic harmony explored especially in Wagner and Bruckner and Richard Strauss, but also infiltrating many, many late romantic composers. So I thought, for the second movement, I would try to incorporate chromatic harmony. I thought it might be instructive to all of us, you and me both. We'll explore one of the most important and interesting trends in the late Romantic period. As I already said, I'll write it in the form of a theme and variation movement, and I'll try to get the whole thing into one video. We'll tackle the theme first, and then we'll tackle some variations. I'll try to write a long, flowing, romantic theme that does not start out by announcing the home key, that leaves you with ambiguity, that drifts like smoke through key after key. It can finally resolve in the end after an extended harmonic journey. Here's the beginning of a tune that is decidedly not an example of chromatic harmony. This melody is the subject of a rather famous set of variations by Mozart, and everyone knows it as Twinkle Twinkle. I transposed it to the key of G. I want to play it for you and talk a little about what puts it so solidly in the world of classical common practice harmony rather than chromatic harmony. Well, you know how it goes, so I don't need to play any more of it. The very first note is a G, announcing the home key. We repeat the G major chord over and over, like a solid foundation. Then we step to a C major chord, which, in the key of G, is the four harmony. Then we step back to the G major chord, the one harmony, and as the tune progresses, you'll get some five chords in there too, D major chords, but they always step back to the one chord. The essence of the harmonic language is to stand solidly on a G major chord, step away from it for a momentary excursion, and then step back onto it again. It's almost like a stately ballroom dance. That is common practice harmony. 
It has been said that all common practice music, even a very long symphony movement, can be understood at the most elemental level as a stepwise journey from somewhere else back to the one chord. In its more philosophical form, this kind of analysis is sometimes called Schenkerian, after the music theoretician Heinrich Schenker. And although it doesn't explain everything, I find a lot of validity in it. Now I'll show you the opening phrase of a theme that I tried to craft in chromatic harmony. I've put the movement in G major. I didn't just sketch a tune, as I usually do. Instead, I wrote out the chords, because that's the point of this exercise. The chords are the point. The music is more of a sequence of harmonies than a tune in the strict sense. And as usual for an initial sketch, I piled everything into the strings in an unrealistic way. Look at these clumps of notes. That's okay. We'll straighten out the orchestration later. Don't sweat the details. When you compose, always try to get the larger shape of your piece first, then worry about the details. Let's take a listen to this very first phrase of the sketch. Unlike Mozart, this theme does not announce the key that it's in. It doesn't start on a G. It's hard to tell that the thing even is in G major. It starts with a 5-9 chord, one of the most unstable chords. And by unstable, I mean a chord that desperately seeks a resolution. I know many of you are familiar with harmony, but some of you are not. For those who are unfamiliar, let me do a real quick explanation. Each note of the scale gets a number. And in the key of G, obviously, the G is numbered 1. A chord that is built on a G is, therefore, a 1 chord. Count up 5 notes from G, and you get to a D, the 5th degree of the scale. A chord built on a D is, therefore, a 5 chord. To build the 5 chord, you start with the D and stack notes on top of it. The next note in the stack is 3 up, an F sharp. The next note is 5 up, an A. The next is a 7th up, a C. This is called a 5-7 chord, and is one of the most common harmonies. But you can stack an extra note on a 9th up, an E. That's called a 5-9 chord. It's very common in jazz as well. And that's what we have here. From that initial 5-9 chord, the harmonies move. They start to slide through neighbor tones, and they create harmonies in passing. You get a G major chord in passing, and again here, but the phrase doesn't end on G major. It doesn't resolve. Instead, it ends on another crunchy version of the 5-9. Maybe this one's better described as a diminished 2-7. There's different names you can stick on these chords, depending on how you interpret them. And the names don't matter. What matters is there's no resolution. The phrase begins and ends on an unstable chord, and we're left floating. We're not allowed to get our feet solidly onto the ground floor of G major. We're not in Mozart land anymore. Here's the next phrase. I'll play the first two phrases together so you see how they connect. This second phrase also avoids reaching any resolution. In fact, far from landing on the home chord of G major, this phrase slips into an entirely new key, the key of E minor. We've modulated away from the home key without even establishing it first. But it's not really a modulation. Modulating is a more formal process of moving to a new key and then establishing that new key. Here the music is just as unanchored in E minor as it was in G major. It slips from one key to another, one unstable chord to another. Now you see a little of how I'm building these individual phrases and putting them together into a longer structure. I know this can look like a difficult compositional process, but you'd be surprised at how smoothly it goes. Give it a try. If you're not comfortable on staff lines, then sit at a piano and try out different chords. Sound them out, and you'll find combinations that please you. Whether you're trying to create chromatic harmony like this or some other feel to the music, just try some notes and see what sounds good. For this movement, I tried a lot of things that didn't work for me. I did a lot of sifting and editing, and eventually I ended up with a complete theme that I liked. 
Here's the sketch of it. At the end of this video, you'll hear the whole thing, theme and variations. But first, I'll tell you about three specific goals I had when constructing the theme. First, in chromatic harmony, you don't want the music to resolve easily or quickly. It flows through harmonies and keys. Some of the keys here are actually quite remote. I mean, E minor is easy because it's the relative of G major, but I snuck in a lot of passing key changes, including B minor, C minor, F minor. It's quite hard to tell that the tune is supposed to be in G major until it finally resolves at the end. And then it needs a really strong harmonic resolution to overcome all that ambiguity and make sure the ending feels satisfying. Second, I wanted the tune to be long. This is not Twinkle Twinkle, which is literally only about 20 seconds long. To give a real sense of unanchored harmonic floating, I spun out the tune for two and a half minutes. After all, it's supposed to be a second movement, slow, heartfelt, full of good romantic emotions like yearning and pathos. And it needs to be long enough for you to feel like you've properly squeezed all that emotion out of it. And along with that long, flowing tune, I wanted to avoid a highly structured organization. A classical tune is like a crystal. It has a perfect, symmetric organization. Four measures per phrase, two phrases per period. Here, I try to be a little more ambiguous. Or sly, maybe, is the right word. Certainly, here's a four-bar phrase. Here's another four-bar phrase. But what do you do with this chunk? The music is ambiguous as to whether this is the next phrase or whether this is a pickup and this is the next phrase. And you end up with a segment that's 11 measures long, which is very irregular. That irregularity, the ambiguity of the phrase structure, helps to bring out the harmonic ambiguity. There's less of a strong rhythmic point at which the harmonies want to resolve. And my third goal here was, of course, the orchestration. The key to this orchestration, I think, is the theme and variation structure. The initial statement of the theme should be as simple as we can reasonably get it, which sets us up for the more colorful, dramatic variations to follow. That means we should not pile on a lot of bombastic instruments at the outset. We need a gentle touch. Maybe you know Brahms' variations on a theme by Haydn. The initial statement of the theme is stripped down, simple, just in the woodwinds. Then it goes nuts, and for 20 minutes the variations go through all the color and drama that Brahms could manage. But that first statement has a kind of instrumental purity to it. I'm also thinking of another famous late romantic piece, the so-called Adagietto, the slow movement of Mahler's Fifth Symphony. Amazing, amazing example of simple orchestration, especially because it's all strings and harp. Nothing else. No big, colorful orchestra. You can wring a lot of heartfelt emotions out of a string orchestra. So I thought I'd be restrained in the instruments here for this first statement of the theme, the first few minutes of the movement, all the stacked chords that I put in the sketch, I distributed among the string orchestra in a very straightforward way. Here and there, I put in a little extra color. A horn hanging in the background can provide some resonance and continuity. Some woodwinds here and there can add color to the melodic line, but the orchestration remains light. Now let's go to the more intense part. Let's talk about the variations. A proper late romantic theme and variation movement would be about eight bazillion hours long. I think it was a matter of pride to see how long you could get. At 10 variations, 2.5 minutes each, and the initial theme, the movement would math out to about 28 minutes long. That would be fun, but a giant movement would destroy the symphony. It would crush all the other movements under its bloated humpback whale weight. To make the movement more consistent with the others, I tried something that's either an act of creative genius or a joke. I'm not sure which. I used the smallest number of variations, such that you could still technically call it variations on a theme. In specific, I wrote two variations. That's it. The whole movement clocks in at about six and a half minutes, and that's enough to work nicely as a tutorial on this type of music. I'll tell you my bizarre aesthetic reason for picking two variations instead of three. If I had three variations, 
then with the initial theme, the movement would have four segments to it. And I don't like that. I don't like a movement structured around four. Three-part form is far more common and feels better to me. It has a natural symmetry, and it makes it easier to craft an overall dramatic arc to the movement. I'll leave four parts to the number of movements, not to the structure within a movement. You can build a movement any way you like, and I'm just telling you about some of the weird aesthetic impulses that go through my head. Here we are at the start of Variation 1. I won't play the whole variation yet, just the beginning of it, so we can talk about orchestral colors. Remember, at this point in the music, all anyone's heard is the theme, mostly in plain vanilla strings. The job of this first variation is to introduce much more orchestral color. That's what I want to emphasize. This is really different from the kind of orchestration I've shown in previous videos, especially if you go back to my classical symphony videos. I've tended to show you a classical and early romantic style that heavily emphasizes the string orchestra. Other instruments are used for added dabs of color. But here the strings are no different from any other instrument. They are used as a dab of color. We have these fast repeated notes, 30 second notes, creating an exciting background sound. And we have pizzicato. The players are plucking the strings instead of bowing them. And the rest of the instruments are also all used with an eye toward color, ever-changing color. The woodwinds are coming in and out in different combinations. First the clarinets, then bassoons, oboes, and flutes. Here we have bassoons and plucked lower strings for another sound. Here a little fragment of the melody is even carried by the horns. The point is you're getting a constantly shifting palette of colors. If you want real color, you can include a lot of other instruments. Just check out a Mahler score. You'll find a piccolo all squeaky on top, maybe six clarinets to make a really distinctive sound. I love the bass clarinet. It has a unique sound, almost like a warm human voice. And when you get into the percussion, you'll find triangles, bells, wood blocks, wind machine, snare drum, bass drum, gong. I mean, Tchaikovsky used cannons. You can get a lot of changing colors. It's quite amazing. Late Romantic composers loved to put in choruses or solo singers or church organs or harp. So many options. The reason why I'm leaving them out here is that the score would get too dense to see anything if I had 30 staff lines. I've stripped it down to the most conservative set of instruments. It's barely a late romantic orchestra, but I'm trying to use it to its fullest. I urge you in your own orchestration to use all the colorful instruments you want. You may notice that compared to my previous videos, I've got two staffs for the horns instead of my usual one. With two horns per staff, we now have four horns. This is not a lot, it's standard, and I could easily have had six horns, three on each staff. But this will do. If you want a massive brass sound that blows your ears off, you can have six horns, four trumpets, I only have two. You can have three trombones and a tuba at the bottom. That's a brass section. This here is barely a late romantic section. To see our brass section in action, let's scroll ahead to the beginning of the second variation. Here we see a thicker orchestra. I'm using all the available instruments. I'll play just a little of this, and I apologize to your ears, but it is a loud part. Now that 
that's a late romantic sound, the chromatic harmony is now joined up with the huge orchestra sound. You don't really get a chance in a loud section like this for delicate sound painting. You don't really hear individual instruments adding this color and that flavor. Instead, you have a few massive blocks of instruments. You have the woodwinds in thirds. The woodwinds are tracking the violins. You have the bass line in the strings and bassoons. You have the power bass line in the trombones. The brass, when they appear, dominate everything. It often sounds like the brass are so loud that nothing else matters. You might as well not have the rest of the orchestra in a loud part. But that's an illusion. The brass by itself, the raw brass belting out massive chords, is very harsh on the ears. It's almost impossible to listen to. It's a sound that 20th century composers sometimes used to create very harsh, violent, or sarcastic music. When you add in the rest of the orchestra packed around the brass, it changes the sound quality and makes it more resonant, rounder, grander, and more pleasing to the ears. As an example, let's scroll to the very end of the movement, the final measures. Here, the sound is coming mainly from the brass section. All four horns, two trumpets, and three trombones. The trumpets doubled up on this high note and supported an octave lower by the first and second horns, cut through everything and dominate the sound. The strings are really just doubling the brass ensemble. The woodwinds are doing the same thing. There's no fancy background layers here, no hidden rhythms and counter melodies. Everything is playing together, doubled up on the same harmonies. This kind of writing produces a huge, glorious, powerful effect. Let's listen to it, with the volume turned down a little so I don't hurt your ears. I love this end, by the way. It's huge. It's like something out of Mahler, but it's attached to the end of a tiny six-minute movement. There's something kind of glorious, but also comic about that. It tickles my sense of humor. Well, I think it's time to hear the whole movement, without interruptions, so let's return to the beginning. We're ready to listen to a theme in chromatic harmony followed by two variations in a late romantic style. I hope you like it, and I hope you gained something from this lesson.
Thank you so much for staying with me until the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed learning about music here, and make sure to subscribe and hit that like button. I'll talk to you next time.